Central Park, right inside Central Park, up and down 7th Avenue. They're shaking the cups, but I guarantee you they have a box cutter inside their coat. And I guarantee you they'll cut your purse right off your body or cut the wallet right out of your pants if they sense that you're weak and that you have something of value. It's a jungle that is kept in check only by the police, the thin blue line, which de Blasio has attacked repeatedly along with his leftist cohorts. And you know, there are consequences to rhetoric. The consequences now are dead police. But now we go back to the war on police. And the reason Obama wants a war on police is so evident to anyone with a, a, the ability to reason that I'll lay it out for you if you can't think. And it's as simple as this. He wants to show how bad the police are uh, against minorities. You see, most of the police in America are white. And that's a crime to Barack Obama. You understand that. He has a racial lens on his uh, iris. And he can only see things through a racial lens. It's worked for him. If you read his own autobiography, he said he really not didn't have a racial consciousness when he was a young biracial man in Hawaii. He never thought about it. And then something happened after being a pot-smoking uh, wayward youth in Pepperdine University, I believe, when he was an ordinary American kid, not political, he said in his own autobiography. He went to Columbia University, a once great university, which has become a cesspool of anti-Americanism. And at Columbia University, he joined in with the communists, the white commies and the black radicals, and he grew his hair out, he said, his own words now, I'm not making anything up. And he said he noticed something happened. People were suddenly paying attention to him in a different way. And look where it got him. Just look how far it got him. It worked for him. Now, if you were him, would you stop the rhetoric of your youth if it's made you the president of the United States? What would have you stop it? It doesn't matter how many countries die or how many people die. All that matters is that you're having a grand old narcissistic time. And on that note, I'll take a break. I'll be right back. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Let me go from the war on police being conducted by the federal government and their liberal cohorts. Another cop was shot dead. I want to read you some of the stories and headlines on michaelsavage.com. Donald Trump on Savage Show, which is a picture of myself and Mr. Trump, and of course my dog Teddy. I, I say of course, because he's always with me, wherever he can be. And uh, it's a great picture. Next one says, 59% back Trump on deportation of illegals. Really, that's shocking. Now, here's an interesting story I stumbled upon. Virginia environmentalist follows in Soros and buys into beleaguered fossil fuel. Another phony. Another billionaire environmentalist who made a fortune in, other, in another field is now buying bankrupt St. Louis-based Patriot Coal for $400 million following a major investment in coal by the billionaire liberal activist George Soros. So they ran the price of coal down by running coal out of America, and then they ran in and scooped up the coal companies. Here is a tragically horrendous story. Murder of elderly couple in Sicily fuels Italy's growing anti-immigrant sentiment from the London Telegraph. And take a guess who slit the throats of this elderly couple in Sicily. They were pensioners. They had worked all their lives in Germany in a Mercedes plant. They went home to live out the few years they had left in Sicily. An 18-year-old African migrant from the Ivory Coast who was in Italy only a short period of time allegedly slit the throat of Vincenzo Solano, 68, and then attacked his wife, Mercedes Zabania, 70. Ms. Zabanias fell to her death from a second-floor balcony as she ran away from the robbers. The murderer, or the alleged murderer, the African asylum seeker from the Ivory Coast, Mr. Kamara, is one of thousands of illegal aliens and refugees living at nearby Mineo in southeastern Sicily. They're arriving by boat from Libya. And I'll just rest my case right there. I ran into a young Sicilian young man a few months ago working in a restaurant that my friend owns in San Francisco. And I asked him, why did you leave Sicily? Your family is there, don't you miss? He said, I miss my family and friends very much. He said, but there's no work for me in Sicily. They're giving whatever little work there is to illegal aliens from Africa. I said, who's giving them the jobs? He said, the liberals in, in Sicily. I said, liberals in Sicily? He said, yes. 
the liberals in Sicily have taken over the government. So what's left? More than 100,000 refugees have arrived by boat in Italy this year. Can you, anyone listening to this show tell me that Europe will survive another 20 years? Can anyone listening to the show tell me that Europe will be a civilized place in 20 years? Can anyone listening to the show tell me there will be new art of the magnitude that Europe is world famous for? Or will Europe descend into chaos and become another third world hellhole? All a result of the liberalism that has plagued and infected the entire Western world. Gianluca Bonanno with the Northern League, a staunchly anti-immigrant party of the right, says Italians fear for their lives inside their own homes. And he said, this is Renzi's national security strategy. What kind of country are we living in? We can ask the same question about Obama. What kind of country are we living in when we have no national security strategy? When he is flooding America with illegal aliens and refusing to take the war to the enemy called ISIS. A relative told La Stampa newspaper the murdered couple had returned from living in Germany to enjoy their retirement in Sicily. They shouldn't have died like this, slaughtered like goats. And there, my friends, is the face of Europe under the EU thugs operating in a bubble. Also on michaelsavage.com is a picture of myself with a new hat, new suit, new shirt, new smile with my new book, Government Zero, which will not be out until October. I wish we could move it up because it's my most important and my last nonfiction book. It follows Stop the Coming Civil War. The subtitle says it all, no borders, no language, no culture. But if it was just a repeat of what I had written before, I wouldn't have written it. And I don't want to go into it now because it's too soon, but I would recommend this. If you're a collector of Michael Savage's books and you want to get this last nonfiction book and you want a first printing of it, buy it now on Amazon or one of the other sites where it can be available because if they sell out the first printing, it'll be a second printing. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Now, of course, you may remember there was a young lady named uh, Steinle who was shot in cold blood by an illegal immigrant a few months ago with a gun he claims he found on the bench. That's not been followed up by the uh, city fathers or city mothers or the city transgendered, whoever runs the city, it's hard to tell. Uh, the bums are out of control. Crime is out of control. After the story of the homeless infestation, there's another story out of San Francisco on the crookedest street in San Francisco, known uh, to everyone as the windingest street, known as Lombard Street, no crime. Two guys pull up in a car, grab a camera from a tourist from Thailand, and then shoot him in the shoulder when the Thai tourist ran after them. In the middle of the day, the robbers, undescribed, jumped into a red sedan and sped away. But an officer spotted the getaway vehicle driving onto the San Francisco Bay Bridge and gave chase. CHP officers, hats off to them, and they had one of the suspects and recovered a gun as they stopped in a rental neighborhood in the Oakland area. The other robber took off running when he was cornered by members of the SF Police Department Tactical Division and an Emeryville Police Canine Unit. Now, we do not know if uh, these gentlemen were doing so because of any grievances, but we do know that San Francisco has now become virtually uninhabitable because of the bums crapping in the street, because of the robbery and the crime that's being covered up. And I don't blame the police. I blame liberalism. Liberalism is a mental disorder, and wherever super liberals take over, the cities go to the toilet bowl. Look at New York. You, you take your life in your hands, walking around with the folks with the box cutters underneath the, uh, the cup, the shaking cup. I want to talk about the bums in San Francisco. Now, you know the city for its Golden Gate Bridge, the mixture of uh, cultures and races, the beautiful fog, and ma mainly the bums, the out-of-control bums who came into the city mainly during the hippie era. They urinate in your face now. They've been doing this for a long time, but it's gotten real bad under the new mayor, Mayor Ed Lee. The worst mayor in the history of San Francisco has brought about a crime wave unseen in the city's history. In other words, what you call homeless, 
the word homeless itself is a fabrication of the radical left. Because so far as I know, there is no biblical... I don't. I, let's talk about the Constitution, not not the Bible. Can anyone show me where in the Bible it says I owe a bum a house? Show me where it says I owe them a house. What I owe them is a jail cell or a mental hospital. That's the only housing that they're entitled to. So the bums are now so brazen because the cops have been neutralized by the liberals that they're literally openly defecating and peeing in the streets in front of people. How did we get here? What would you do to end the scourge, the, the pandemic of the bums in the streets? Well, let's start with who put them in the streets. I have an article that I researched for you from 1984 from the New York Times, if you could believe it, when the New York Times was still a newspaper of note. This article by Richard Lyons is entitled, How Release of Mental Patients Began. The policy that led to the release of most of the nation's mentally ill patients from the hospital to the community, is now widely regarded as a major failure, he wrote, 1984. Sweeping critiques of the policy, notably the recent report of the American Psychiatric Association, have spread the blame everywhere, faulting politicians, civil libertarian lawyers, and psychiatrists. But who specifically played some of the more important roles in the formation of this ill-fated policy? What motivated these influential people and what lessons are to be learned? This is all from 1984. In California, for example, the number of patients in state mental hospitals reached a peak of 37,000 in 1959 when Edmund G. Brown was governor. It fell to 22,000 when Ronald Reagan attained that office in 1967 and continued to decline under his administration and that of his successor, Edmund G. Brown, uh, Jr., the senior Mr. Brown now expresses regret about the way the policy started and ultimately evolved. They've gone far too far in letting people out, he said in an interview. Dr. Robert H. Felix, who was then director of the National Institute of Mental Health and a major figure in the shift to community centers, says, quote, on reflection, many of those patients who left the state hospitals should never have done so. We psychiatrists saw too much of the old snake pit saw too many people who shouldn't have been there, and we overreacted. The result is not what we intended, and perhaps we didn't ask the questions that should have been asked when developing a new concept, but psychiatrists are human too, and we tried our damnedest close quote. Dr. John A. Talbot, president of the American Psychiatric Association, said, remember that is in 1984, the psychiatrists involved in the policy making at the time certainly oversold community treatment and our credibility today is probably damaged because of it. He said the policies were based partly on wishful thinking, partly on the enormousness of the problem and the lack of a silver bullet to resolve it then as now. I'll go on. Do you know how to solve the problem? We have a problem. The psychiatrists made a mistake. The liberal lawyers made a mistake. They released people from nut houses onto the streets. They have now metastasized into whole armies of bums who are destroying our civility and our way of life. How would you solve this problem? It's a simple question. And there are simple answers. It's not that complicated. You have to ignore the homeless advocates because they're nothing but troublemakers like the illegal alien advocates who are in it for the money. They're like George Ramos of the homeless. It's that simple. What would you do to stop it? How would you solve the homeless infestation? There are answers raging from the liberal answer, which is build them all houses, and you well know what would happen if you gave every bum a house or an apartment. They would destroy it. They would destroy it within 30 days. It, they would become uninhabitable cesspools. The other side says lock them up, put them in a mental hospital. Now, I want to talk about that side of it. As you well know, most of the homeless bums are mentally ill or overt criminals hiding from the law. I've known this for years. They're extremely dangerous as a population. Not all, but many of them are extremely dangerous criminals hiding out as homeless. Uh, the other class are mentally ill who belong in mental hospitals. But Governor Jerry Brown's father, uh, Governor Edmund Pat Brown, closed the state mental hospitals uh, as, uh, by law. And then when Ronald Reagan became governor, he had to uh, follow the law, and he went ahead and followed Edmund Pat Brown's law and closed the, the mental hospitals. As a result, people who would normally be locked up for doing things along the lines of crapping in the street, urinating in the street, uh, spitting on people, etc., breaking windows, would be arrested. They would be considered mentally incompetent, and they'd be put in a place where they can get the care that they need, which is a mental hospital. 
But all the mental hospitals were closed. Now, I have said we should reopen the mental hospitals. I've said this as far as 15 years ago on the Savage Nation.